Hey friends, this is Jennifer, and this is the Jennifer Allwood Show, the podcast for women who want to find freedom in both their life and in their business. I help women find the courage to fulfill their calling in life without sacrificing their faith or their family. In this show, I give you my very best life and business advice, plus bring you world-class guests and give you a healthy dose of Jesus every single time. So buckle in, my friend. I'm so excited you're here today. Hey friends, Jennifer here. I'm going to be interviewing a friend of mine today. You're going to be hearing from the amazing Brooke Thomas, who you might recognize Brooke's name. I am in the Queen's Table Mastermind with her and um, Lisa Bevere. Brooke is the founder of the Live Out Loud um, platform. She is just a powerhouse entrepreneur who has built an eight-figure empire um, where she really encourages women to write their own rules for success. We're going to talk today about kind of where that stemmed from and what prompted her to kind of get out of, um, you know, a traditional nine to five and go out working for her own. Um, for those of you who have had any health challenges ever, as you have, um, you know, been building a business, Uh, I think this is going to minister to your heart. Brooke hosts a very successful weekly podcast called the Live Out Loud Show. She's a motivational and keynote speaker and author um, and has been featured in numerous media outlets like Forbes and the Huffington Post. I will add, she's probably the most positive person that I personally know. Like she just, she just exudes, eludes. What's the word? Um, She leaks positivity to everything and everyone around her, which by the way, is also just absolutely contagious. So I think you're going to love this podcast episode. We are going to be focusing and talking mostly today about your inner critic and how all of us, regardless of our success level, have an inner critic that tries to sideline us and persuade us to, you know, stop what we're doing. Uh, We all have those inner voices, not because we're crazy, but because we're human that try to get us, you know, to sit down and shut up and and um, quit um, trying to make a difference in the world. So we're going to be talking about that today. Grab a cup of coffee, get settled in. I think you're going to love this podcast with my friend, Brooke Thomas. Well, hello, Miss Brooke. Hello, how are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited to have you here today. I feel like um, I'm going to need to like raise my energy level to make sure that I meet yours. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm excited. I feel like you're my... um, bright colored twin. I would agree with that. I said in the intro for you that you're probably the most positive person I know, but I did fail to mention we both share a love of bright colors, pink especially, um, all of the things. So we're so excited to have you here. This is going to be fun. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm so Okay. Excited. So the people know that I'm in a mastermind with you and we've become, you know, friends in real life, but I would love if you would just share with our listeners kind of what your background is in terms of we, you know, I explained to them what you do today, but how did you get started in business? Would you kind of give them a little bit of a background? Okay. So I went to college. I was a business major. That's what I thought sounded good on paper. Everybody told me you should go into business. And I graduate with a business degree. I go into the corporate world. I have an amazing job that looks great on paper. But to be honest, I never felt aligned with it. I I didn't realize that I had such a creative spirit in me. Mm -hmm. because I was told most of my life that I wasn't creative, that I was meant for business. And I do love business, but I wasn't doing what... I was called to do. I was doing what everyone else wanted me to do and what looked good on paper for the people right. that, you know, I I was surrounded with at that time, family, friends. Yeah. And so I got this amazing corporate job. Um, I was married and then uh, got pregnant. We started a family and I found out in my first trimester of pregnancy at 26 years old, that I had stage three cancer. I cannot like, I, and I know your story. So people that are, you know, listening may be new to this, but in the middle of a pregnancy to get a cancer diagnosis, I can't even, and, and your first pregnancy, like walk me through that. How absolutely terrifying was that? And obviously you are a woman of God and, you know, faith is very much a part of your life and who you are, but um, I'm sure the reality of that was, it was terrifying. Yes, it it was. And, you know, it was like one of those things where I was 26, you know, in this career, 
that again, looked good, sounded good. I get married, I'm starting a family. And when everybody else around me was kind of in that same zone, um, you know, I get this cancer diagnosis and the doctors told me the severity of the cancer and my blood work. And they showed me, they actually lined up several different cases that were similar to mine, similar age, same type of cancer. And they said they're, what they wanted me to do is to have chemotherapy and abort the baby. Oh, so that was what they guided me into doing. And I, I said, there has to be another way. You know, I kind of am the type of person that when something traumatic happens, I get into a zone where I'm like, okay, game face on, like, this is not what I'm doing. What do I need to do? I'm not doing that. Right. And they said, the only other option is that we can cut the cancer out and go deep and wide, get all around the margins, but you have to do it immediately. And you cannot have any anesthetic except for topical lidocaine because you're in your first trimester of pregnancy. I, so I, I still, every time I hear you say this and tell this story, I'm like, I just, I, I can't even get like a tooth worked on <laughs> without, without laughing gas. And so in my head, I'm like, how does one do surgery with no anesthetic? And so I know that that is what you opted to do. So tell me about that. Yeah. You know, and again, it's, I think, you know, this is almost 18 years ago and, yeah. you know, I was a completely different person. I think out of adrenaline and just saying, I just want this fixed and I want to move on and I want to just cover this up and keep moving. I just did it. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I, I don't think I thought about it, you know, very much. I was just like, this is the option I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, four or five nurses held me down. Literally it was on my side. It was stage three melanoma and skin cancer spreads hard and fast when you're pregnant because of your hormones. Uh, and that's why they were concerned. Uh -huh. Um, and they literally 50 stitches on my side cauterized me. I felt everything. It was, they put something in my mouth, like a, a ball that I had to squeeze, you know, with, with my mouth. And yeah. I just remember, I mean, yes, I'm a woman of God and my faith is so strong, but back then it was definitely not there. Like I, it was just surface, you know, uh -huh. and I just remember praying and, and to be totally transparent, I back then actually thought that I deserved this, that maybe this is happening to me because I deserved it. And I, I don't know, you know, there's many reasons I thought that, yeah. but I, I tell that to people because I think that, you know, on the outside, nobody would have ever known I thought that, but right. it was one of those moments where I'm like, of course, my life isn't just going to turn out the way that I was hoping, you know, like I, I'm married, I'm pregnant, mm -hmm. you know, of course, something has come against me and I probably deserve it. It's and kind I of was, like that the shoe is always going to drop yes, type of, yes. yeah, like, like thinking, yes, I know what you're saying. And I say that because I do think people, you know, I always want to tell people like, I am the way I am now and, and the way I've been the last, you know, 15 years for a reason because I, I wasn't always like this. Now, people yeah. didn't know on the outside, I, I was happy. I was a, you know, a professional people pleaser, but, you know, I, I literally inside thought that this was just like, I deserved it for some reason. And I can't explain really why, but I, I think so many people go through that and they don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And that really was my transformation into really, going deep with the Lord and understanding who he was and understanding who I was yes. and really understanding what my purpose was on in this life. And that that wasn't the case, but it took a while. Okay. All right. Well, I love, I love that you are sharing that with us. And if I remember correctly at the time, Brooke, you still were working in corporate America. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I was working in corporate America. I, I go through this like very traumatic situation. Yes. Uh -huh. um, at the time, you know, my, my husband was in medical sales. So I'll, I just remember every day, every night, these, you know, the, the huge, um, kind of wound on my side, 50 stitches, you know, every time, a, a you know, the, the, um, stitches would open up, you know, and there would be just, you know, it would just be painful yeah. Yeah. Things would happen as I grew out front in my pregnancy mm -hmm. and mentally and physically, it just did a number on me. I ended up 
um, resigning from the job I had. And I was just in so much physical pain on the side Mm -hmm. as I was growing. And I was kind of going through just emotional and mental pain that at the time, again, like no one was really talking about mental health, mental wellness, you know, I'm just a 26 year old pregnant woman that should just be happy that they cut the cancer out and I'm going to be good to go. Like, that's how I felt. Okay. So I didn't really have anybody to talk to about how I really felt. I just pretended that I was just happy that I'm alive, you know, and I'm just going to get through this pregnancy. And through that time, you know, that's when I really discovered who God really was, because when I, when I resigned from that job, I spent a lot of time reading scripture and talking to women that wanted to pour into me that I believe God put into my life. Yeah. They really showed me things in scripture that I had never seen before. And I started to pray in a different way because all of that hopelessness and all of that shame and despair that I felt inside that I couldn't get out I I realized through reading scripture and praying that that's, that was not God's plan for my life. And that's when I started to actually come alive. Now it wasn't overnight by any means. Like it took a good two years throughout like me having the baby and then just continuing to figure out who I am and why I'm really here and what I'm really capable of outside of what other people tell me I should do. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. So when you did leave corporate America, what, yeah. what business were, did you start first? If you, I know you have a very impressive background in network marketing. So did you go to a network marketing company first? No. Okay. So first when I, when I left, you know, okay. So my personality is like, okay, I'm going to rest and just figure this out. And I got bored really easily because I, I didn't want to just hang out and yep. you know, hang out with people and just talk about surface level things. So I ended up getting my real estate license. So I had an excuse to like stay inside and learn. Okay. (laughs) And then I was like, okay, I'm still a professional. I've got my real estate license, but I really didn't like that either. I just wanted to prove to myself. I think I could get that. Uh Um, And then what really happened was I started to want to, I started to be obsessed about healthy living because the doctors actually, I want to tell you the good news to my cancer. Actually, I I didn't go full circle. So the doctors told me that if I chose the route to cut the cancer out instead of chemo and and aborting the baby, that most likely I would not live past 40. Okay. They they spoke that over me. This is why I'm so careful with my words and the way I am because those words that that they spoke over me and that image really took a toll. That was part of the toll that it took on me as far as feeling hopeless and like, okay, I might only have till 40. And, you know, I, I really replayed that over and over and over again in my mind. And it took me down a place of such defeat that that's when I, when I read scripture that told me a different story, that's when I started to come alive. And I thought, okay, the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that there is actually hope and a future for me. Yes. So I'm going to sit on that for a little bit. And then like Ephesians three twenty said that I should believe bigger and ask for more and God will do super abundantly more. So I just started praying into that and going, okay, God, like what else can I ask for? Like, I'm going to, I'm, I started envisioning that I would be the healthiest 40 year old mom. Mm -hmm. And I literally envisioned it and I spoke it out every day, like at, you know, 27, 28, 29, I kept saying, I'm going to be the healthiest 40 year old woman, 40 year old mom. And so that took me on a journey to actually discover uh, nutrition and wellness. And I started educating myself on ingredients and health and understanding that like our bodies are meant to thrive and not, you know, not just survive Mm -hmm. and foods that might have been adding inflammation in my body that could have been adding to, you know, that cancer coming back or not and all of those things. So I became like obsessed with that. And then I just started like, you know, out of the need for, you know, I I ended up having a second girl. So I had these two little girls at home and I felt so paralyzed in the kitchen. Like I, Brett, 
my husband was the cook, okay? My husband is too, yep. Okay, so you, you know <laughs> what I'm I saying, know. right? Yes. So I'm like, you know, really getting into this whole health thing and nutrition and ingredients, realizing all the things I need to stay away from, all the things I need to add. And I felt like all the information back then that was out there was so complicated and it was so overwhelming. And there wasn't like yummy, delicious, healthy foods that, you know, were simple. Yeah. And I kept thinking in my mind, I felt like God, like I kept praying that I could, you know, figure this out in a simple way. Because if I felt this way, other people had to have felt this yeah. way too. Uh -huh. And so I just started kind of simplifying all of these overcomplicated recipes and overcomplicated information into things like, you know, what you just need to remove and what you need to add yes. and just making it so simple. And, you know, I just became obsessed with creating things when I didn't even realize I was creative. I created these grocery, um, they were, they were laminated cards. Okay. Imagine this. They were laminated cards and they were called grocery flip tips or something. And they, I put them on a, a keychain, and I had every single aisle, like every single, you know, category of food yes. where it says like, stay away from this and add this. Now I thought that I was going to become a multimillionaire uh -huh. <laughs> on QVC and to the today show with these amazing products. And, you know, I, this was before like the iPhone and the app and sure. You know, yeah. all the things that we can get at our fingertips now, right? I'm thinking that people are going to carry around a keychain with these cards that are laminated around the grocery store. Forever. Yeah, but you know what? At least you, you like did something, like you tried something. Yes. You had an idea, which I love. Well, that's what sparked everything else. Just being able to create something that was meaningful for myself and my family and then teach other people yes. is where this all started. And then, and then it turned into lunchbox kits because as my kids were growing and as I was kind of growing into what I was discovering. I just kind of created things and then brought people along with me. And then yes. I ended up creating um, two recipe books that are like super simple. Everything is like five ingredients or less. And they were called the thankful 30 recipe books because they were 30 recipes because that's all I could do. And I was so thankful Hilarious. for these 30 recipes. I love it. I love it though. And so what I love about your storybook is that you took something that the enemy intended for evil. Yes. And you, and you used it for good. And so that kind of started like the catalyst of you really becoming an entrepreneur then, right? Yes, absolutely. So I, I did that. And then I ended up on this NBC show as like mom on a mission and healthy lifestyle expert. And then the network marketing piece actually came several years later when I just wanted something that would complement this other piece of health and nutrition. And I just started taking vitamins from um, uh, you know, a network marketing company. Uh -huh. And it just by accident, again, I was one of those women that said, I will never do that. Yep. That's not what I want to do without really, you know, really investigating it and understanding what it could look like. And right. just again, by passion and by accident, I ended up growing this massive team and became the top of that company while I was doing all of these other things. Um, I ended up going into corporations, schools, hospitals with all of this nutrition and wellness um, information and all of these books and kits. And, you know, again, I thought I was going to sell tens of thousands, yes. but I ended up giving most of them away as an add on bonus because um, just, I, you know, it was just yeah. one of those things where sometimes what you're passionate about, um, not everybody is at the time. I think I, I was always like kind of, you know, now it probably would have done really well. Um, but I lived in North Carolina and I was kind of like the awkward, weird one that was trying to make my yeah. kids black bean brownies. <laughs> other moms were like making fun of me, you know? Right. Uh, but, but it, it really was also, it, it sounds like it was almost like a gateway drug though, too. It got you yes. in terms of like, it introduced you to a lot of new people and yes. introduced other people to you. Yes. And then, you know, God kind of used that as a springboard. Yes. And it absolutely just opened up in a completely new avenue of creativity in me that I never knew I had. Yeah. It, it built confidence in me and it helped me to understand that whatever I wanted to do and whatever I wanted to create and whatever was in my heart, I was just going to go after. And all of the things I did, I just couldn't believe uh, what I was, what everything built, like 
a pawn to, to, to do the next thing, the next thing. And I ended up creating a healthy lifestyle series that was four weeks, four different sessions. Mm -hmm. And I presented it to a corporation because I had this idea. Again, it was just like these downloads were happening and creativity. And like, I knew that, you know, these big corporations where I lived had these lunch and learns where big yeah. insurance companies like United Healthcare would go in. And I knew some of the people at these companies that I could pitch this idea to. And I remember them laughing, like, you're just one girl, like, like we, you know, th this, we're not doing this. And yeah. I would just keep asking to come back and come back. Could I pitch them again? And it took a year and a half to get the first yes from this big corporation. And I charged $4,800 for four sessions. And I thought that was like the most amazing thing that I could ever do. And I, cause I created an awesome. by myself and and then do you know that two years later, I was selling that same, that same exact program for $48,000. And then it ended up, I got, I sold it as high as 68,000 the last time that I, I ever did that program. So you literally just added a zero. Yeah. So that really prompted me. I kind of yeah. had some, you know, people around town were hearing about all the things I was doing. Yeah. And I having all these women approach me. How did you do this? How did you get on TV? How did you do this? How'd you get in the corporations? How are you at the top of your network marketing company? And I, my heart was to help so many people. I know it's, that's how you are. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do I get this information in the hands of all of these women? And that's really where live out loud was born and the mentorship and the masterminds, because it allowed me to bring groups of women together mm -hmm. and really mastermind with them on how to create what they were meant to create because I really believe anybody can do anything they want if they've got the passion and the drive and they take action and it's like one step at a time. I totally 100% agree with you. So um, some of the people that are listening, well, um, as you know, Brooke, I have a mastermind of women. And so you recently came into my next level mastermind and we're talking about like the inner critic. And one of the things that probably I'm guessing if I was just a guessing girl, my guess would be that people would assume, okay, so Brooke is this young, vibrant, um, super positive, you know, smart girl. And, um, and so she, you know, the glass is not only half full, but the glass is beautiful with like this really cool pink striped, you know, <laughs> straw and glitter on the glass. So people, I'm wondering if they sometimes assume about you that just because you're all of these ways that you don't have like your own, like, inner critic and you don't have like your own, you know, mental dialogues that happen to a lot of us. Um, and so I want to talk about that because as you were building, you know, um, you know, you had ideas and you're doing the cookbook and then you're talking at um, companies and then you're putting together your masterminds. Like, did you struggle at all with the inner critic? Like that voice in your head? Well, what was the voice in your head saying? Cause I know the oh. voice in my head you know, it changes at different yes. times, depending on what I'm doing. But a lot of times it's like, nobody's ever going to buy this. Um, you have no idea what you're talking about. There's times when I think, you know, because I'm a lot older than you and, you know, I'm getting ready to turn 51, like you've missed your window. And so oh, yeah. I just would, I would love to know about your inner critic and what that sounds like for you. Yeah. It's the number one thing I'm the most passionate about in transformation with women, because it is the thing that we hear every single day. I'm sure you hear it too, no matter what the age is in the twenties, thirties, forties, all the way to seventies, this, you know, you're not good enough. You're yeah, not yeah. worthy. You're not smart enough. You talk too fast. You talk too much. You don't talk enough. You're you too, too much. much energy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're too, too much. much. Right. Yeah. And so I had to go through when I tell you years, years and years and years, every single time I had an opportunity to speak, whether it was at a corporation or on TV, I went through such panic and people would never guess that about me. Cause I, I am outgoing. Yes. I actually have never, you know, had a problem talking to somebody and making a friend, but there's a whole different world when you put yourself out there, um, you know, on TV or even in like, even on a stage, we were just talking yeah. about that earlier, or yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it, it put your, pa your passion out there. And I was so bad and so nervous. And when I say I was so bad, I'm talking, I'm not just saying that I would shake and my face would turn red. And I was so overwhelmed with embarrassment in the middle of, of, of 
of doing that and my voice would crack. And I remember the opportunity that I was given to do these things. And I said, yes, and I did it. And it was awful. And all I did was pray and say, okay, I did it one time. I can say I did it one time. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Let's move on. And then they would call back and they said, they want me again, especially on the TV. And I thought, okay, now I'm wondering the second time I was like, okay, this time I can be better. I'll go back. If they're giving me an opportunity, I don't want to say no. So I'll go back still same bad. I mean, I yeah. remember, I mean, it was terrible. One time I almost, um, the, uh, the kitchen almost, uh, burned up because of what I did on, <laughs> on the stove, like a fire almost started. Oh, like it was, <laughs> it was that bad. There were so many bad moments. And I really mean that when I say that, and they kept inviting me back and I told the Lord, okay, if, every opportunity I get, I'm going to say yes, but please stop the torture. And I felt like I knew in my heart that I needed to keep going to be better long for the long game, mm -hmm. but it was torturous at the time. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. But I really thought at one point that they were actually um, collecting all my videos to do like a funniest home video <laughs> and like make fun of me. Like that's how bad my uh -huh. inner critic was. And I just kept pushing through. And I even had moments where I would do, you know, events in my neighborhood, you know, at the clubhouse or, yeah. you know, sh you know, sharing people, my network marketing business, sharing people, my wellness company. And I'll never forget. I mean, there were so many moments, Jennifer, where women I heard that were my friends or my neighbors were making fun of me. Um, you know, they were talking about me behind my back. They, you know, even in front of my face, like, why do you want to do that? And that would cause even more of the inner critic. And there was, there was such a long period. I'm 44 right now. And there was such a long period, I would say in my thirties, especially early thirties, where I don't even, I can't even explain why I kept going, yeah. but I can just tell you that me continuing to go through the pain, through the embarrassment, through the critics, inner and outer, is exactly why I can stand so bold, so strong today, and not waver and not be nervous. And it's the number one reason I am the biggest cheerleader for other women. And I know the difference between a woman looking at you and saying, why do you want to do that? Versus like, yet, you know, the cheesiness that I am. Yes, you go, girl. I even have you go, girl hats. And that's like my theme because I saw what another woman did based on an encouragement versus a discouragement. And it's the same thing with our inner critics, what we tell ourselves and what we say. And it's almost like I had to literally get to a place where I just pretended that everybody out there loved me and was cheering me on yeah. and was like, yes. And I almost had to get in my mind and just pretend even when I knew that wasn't true. And then it just, it became true over time. It really mm -hmm. did. And all of the people that needed to leave left. So I know you said you're not sure why you kept going, but I'd love to just like ponder that because yes. was there something in you that like deep down, like just knew you couldn't quit or was it, you just felt so like convinced that this is what God was calling you to, or was it that you had two young girls yeah. watching you? I mean, or was it a combination of all of that? Because I know a lot of our listeners, but they're going to be women who have maybe um, you know, they're either in business and they're trying to scale it, or they've tried starting a business and maybe it didn't go, you know, like they wanted it to, or they, maybe they've recently launched a course or something and, you know, the course launch didn't go quite as they were hoping. And so talk to the girl right now, who's like, so tempted to just throw in the towel. Yes. I mean, listen, there were so many times where I just wanted to hide and cry and never come out of my room because I was embarrassed or I was disappointed or I felt you know, like just worn down from it, or really it came down to even embarrassment. Cause when you put yourself out there and you say, this is what I'm going to do. And it doesn't go the way that you anticipate it. For me, it was embarrassing. And that's why I, I started a brand called live out loud. It wasn't yep. about being louder. It was about taking responsibility to speak out what it is that you're here to do and taking responsibility to do it no matter what, no matter how long the timeline, no matter what happens on the other side, but you are going to do it. And so for me, you're exactly right. Everything you said was what kept me going, but this is what yeah. really kept me going that I would speak out anytime I was anywhere. And I would always say, yes. you have to have a why 
that actually makes you cry. And when I say makes you cry, I mean that it means so much to you that when you speak about it, you get so emotional because it is so meaningful to you. And for me, because of my cancer diagnosis, because doctors told me I would not live past 40, when I had daughters, I remember for so long thinking, no one's gonna stop me from leaving my footprint here on this earth. When and if I ever leave this earth too soon, I want to make sure that my daughters knew that what I did was meaningful and impactful. And I had something here to actually like remind them that I was not just surface, just here to like, just be here, that I was here for a purpose and that I left my footprint here to leave a legacy. And even right now I could get choked up and start crying because that that's what kept me going on the hard days, the bad days. That's what kept going, Mm -hmm. kept me going because I would look at them and I would say it's for them and my legacy because I don't know how long I'm going to be here now. I want to make sure I I don't leave this this podcast without saying that my cancer, that is not my story anymore. I 10 years ago, I they they really named me cancer free. Like I had to go, they told me I would have to go get blood work every three months for the rest of my life. Then it turned into six months, then it turned into a year. And about 10 years ago, I was completely cancer free. And when I turned 40, something like hit me so Something hard. Something happens, doesn't it, when you yes. turn 40? <laughs> and I'm almost 45 now. Yep. And I have to tell you, there is a fire and a confidence and an energy yeah. like never before. Mm-hmm. Nothing and nobody, with that. and no launch or no bad news or it's going to knock me down from living life to the fullest while I'm here. Yeah. Oh, I love that so, so much. And I think you and I share that same... Um, Oh, conviction that we yeah. are just supposed to be doing this in front of our children and, yes. um, and just, you know, trying to leave a legacy for our children and our children's children. So I love that. So, um, okay. So we've talked about the inner critic a little bit. Let's talk about shame just a little bit. Cause yeah. I know you've talked in some of your trainings about shame, stopping us from the success that we were meant to have. Um, so tell me how, tell me what, t- talk to me about shame. Talk to anybody who's here. Cause are you talking about shame? Like in terms of like having failed in business before or shame in terms of your life story or shame. Uh, talk to me all about the shame factor and how it affects us as women in business. Yes. I want, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that right now, but I want to say one last thing to what yes. you said about our kids, because mm-hmm. I just heard this the other day. And I think this is really important for somebody to hear somebody to receive today. I heard that the biggest neglect that we can give our kids, you know, sometimes as moms, we think we're neglecting them if we're a working mom, which I do not agree with at all. I've worked since my kids were little out of choice. And I think it was the best thing that I could have ever done as a mom. And the biggest neglect that I heard that we do as mothers or as, you know, parents is not showing up our fullest self and not showing our kids who we really are and not living our full potential and and leaving it on the table and not going after it. That's the biggest neglect because we're not teaching our kids to do that for themselves. So I just wanted to say that. 100%. 100%. And I love that. And you and I, I think could sit and talk for hours just yeah. about our conviction with building things in front of our kids. Yep. Yeah. Somebody needed to hear that. Cause I don't think we yep. talk about that enough. And then going into the shame, this is another thing that I've discovered, not only with myself, I would have never been able to articulate out loud to anybody that I felt shame. And that's why I thought I deserved the cancer or mm. I felt shame about who I was or where I came from. Until I actually, you know, really went deep with the Lord and other people that guided me. And and when I use the word shame, there's so many layers to this. And the reason why I can speak so confidently about it now is because all all the women that I've ever mentored or or talked to or dealt with when it comes to us going after what it is that we're called to do, it usually is that intimidation and that shame of who we once were or a mistake that happened in our past, or even as I'll I'll share some shames with you. So like, it could be as, um, as something like, like your, your parents getting divorced when you were little and, you know, not ever feeling like you truly fit in anywhere. So most of my life, I kind of felt like I never really fit in anywhere. And I pretended I did, but I never felt like I belonged. And so there was a shame attached to that because I felt that. And I didn't think that I should feel that way, but I did. And then 
as you get older, there's things that maybe mistakes that you make or things that you do that you regret that you say you would never have done. And I, there, you carry a shame from that. And there's, I mean, there's women that I've mentored that come into my space and it could be anything from an abortion to a nose job. Like I had a woman that was so covered in shame because she had, she was working in um, TV and uh, uh, she's a beautiful woman and she's so talented. And she came in saying that she was so covered in shame. She couldn't make the next move in her career because um, a producer told her that her nose was like, you know, not shaped the right way. So she secretly got a nose job. Yeah. And she was so ashamed of that, that I, when she was talking about it, I thought there has to be more to the story. And that was her shame. And that shame was covering her and, um, a, you know, paralyzing her, her voice, her action, just as much as the woman that had an abortion or just as much as the woman that had maybe, um, you know, cheated on her husband or had done something. I'm saying there's so many layers. And yeah. then there's the woman that literally just feels unworthy because she doesn't feel like she belongs because of her parents getting divorced. And it just has carried with her or being made fun of because of the way she looks, you know, and um, again, Again, being too much, not enough, talking too fast, right. talking too slow. There's so many layers to that that actually take on a form of shame that um, that shame causes us to actually be either paralyzed in action or when something happens to us, like a cancer diagnosis, a health diagnosis, or even not being able to, you know, have a, a successful launch, our mind goes right to that shame. Yeah. I, I love that you're talking about this. Most people are not really um, willing to talk about, you know, shame and the inner critic, especially in positions where it appears that you're really successful on the outside. And so I love just that you're being vulnerable enough to share um, some of your own, you know, inner critic voices, shame thoughts, and, and that of other people. I think it's so super important. So um, Brooke, I know when you were in the mastermind, you gave the ladies, um, a freebie you have, they could text you to receive like a freebie playbook that you have in terms of like responses when you, you know, are feeling shame or have the inner critic is kind of uh, screaming in your ear. Um, can we give that to our listeners today? Would that be okay? Oh, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. And they will love that. And uh, all the information will be in the show notes. I'll give you the number. Yeah. And let me give them if you're if you're listening real quick, and you have a pen and paper, you can text the word critic. C-R-I-T-I-C, to the number 310-564-7438. And that will get you Brooks Silence the Critic playbook. And I know that it basically gives you just like, um, it's, I don't want to call it a cheat sheet, but it's like yeah. a cheat sheet. <laughs> oh, it's like one-liners. You know, sometimes yes. it can be so basic what we can do to just silence internal and external. Like again, you know, when you're, when you're excited about something, you're like, I'm good. I'm going to go do this. And somebody just stares at you and they're like, why? Yeah. Why would you want to do that? And it shuts you down unless you have like a comeback statement, which is like smile real big and just be like, why not? Yeah. Nobody can say anything back to that. So yeah. I have five of those one-liners that work really well. And then declaration statements to speak out over you and your situation so that it can really build that confidence. I love that. And, um, and we'll put that in the show notes. If you missed that, you can go to jenniferalwood.com slash podcast and just get on the show notes and you'll, um, there will be a link right there for Brooks silence, the critic playbook. So Brooke, thank you so much for being here. What is next for you? What is on the agenda for you? What are you working on right now? Well, I've got a big event coming up in September at the Ritz Laguna Niguel. Yes. I look forward to that every year. Uh, it's a faith-based business mm -hmm. event. And then, you know, just continuing to grow Queen's Table and yes. the Live Out Loud Elite Mastermind. That's really where my heart is. And, um, you know, just again, connecting with women like you. And I have to say, you have the best women in your network. We do. Thank you. <laughs> it's a reflection of you, Jennifer. I, you yeah. know, I, I have so many women that just speak so highly of you, love you and your books and everything that you do. I just, it's such an honor to just be partnered with you in this life and be able to speak life into other women, but your network is incredible. Well, thank you for that. And I 
you know, we have been really intentional about, um, you know, the audience that I've built and the women that I've built. And so I agree with you. They are the absolute best. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for being here, Brooke. And um, if somebody wants to connect with you on social media, I would assume that you would want for them to find you on Instagram, but I could be wrong, but let me know. Yes. Instagram is my favorite. <laughs> Instagram is, <laughs> is it relationship so- like we all have, right? Yep. Um, yep. That's just that live out loud, Brooke. So anything uh, that you, you search live out loud, Brooke, you'll find me um and then brookthomas.com is my website so awesome all right listeners well do me a solid go find brooke at live out loud on instagram go text the word critic to 310-564-7438 if you want to receive brooke's silence the inner critic playbook Um, but just go give her some love on social media and brooke thank you so much again for being here thank you so much it was such an honor thank you so much jennifer i appreciate you friend Friend, thank you so much for listening to the podcast again this week. I'm so honored that you come back for every episode and that you share the Jennifer Allwood Show with your friends and family. Every time I see you guys post about it on Instagram or Facebook or something, it just makes me do a little happy. So thank you. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast if you never want to miss an episode. So you can go to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or any of the other podcasting places and subscribe each week so that every week you get the new episode when it releases. So just know that I love bringing you relevant content. I love bringing you great guests. And one of the ways you can help us here at Team Allwood is by leaving the podcast a review. So if you have just a second to do that, would you go over and leave a review for the Jennifer Allwood Show? Thank you again. You're amazing. I'm honored to be here. Until next week. Bye-bye.